Okay, today I want to talk to you about the marriage supper of the Lamb. What does the Bible teach about this prophetic event that's yet to come in the future? Well, if you've ever been to a wedding or been through a wedding yourself, you know that there are seven basic parts to a wedding. Okay? First of all, and the most important aspect to a wedding is you have to have a bridegroom. Okay? Secondly, you have a bride. Also very important. Probably the two most important things aspects to the wedding. If you don't have a bride, you don't have a wedding. If you don't have a bridegroom, you don't have a wedding. So you have to have a bridegroom, you have to have a bride. After that, you have to have a betrothal. Okay, I talked about that in my sermon on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Um, in the Bible, there's no engagement. Okay, it's betrothed or espoused. All right, and that is a legally binding type of agreement. Okay, you don't get betrothed and then later change your mind. Betrothal is, you're as good as being married, okay? So, bridegroom, bride, betrothal. Next, you have to have guests for the wedding ceremony. Then you have to have the wedding ceremony itself. Then the reception, or marriage supper, as we'll see in the Bible here. And lastly, you have the honeymoon, okay? And I'm going to be talking today about the bride of Christ. What, if you're a Christian and you're saved right now, today, you are part of the bride of Christ, so this is going to be our future, okay? I'm part of the bride of Christ. If you're part of the if you're saved, then you're part of the bride of Christ. So this is the future that we have to look forward to. And you know, it was uh, oh, a little over a year ago that I got married for the first time, and I'll tell you, it was a very exciting thing, anticipation, looking forward to my marriage. All right, and in like manner, we should be excited about seeing our marriage to Jesus Christ one day. And of course it's spiritual, you know, uh, but we're going to get into this as we go on today. So let's start out here with the bridegroom. Turn to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. We're going to see that Jesus Christ is the bridegroom. Now, he never got physically married while he was here on the earth. Back in Isaiah 53, it talks about that there's none to declare his generation. Um, but Jesus Christ is going to get married one day. Matthew chapter 9, verse 14 and 15. It says here, Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. Who was Jesus Christ talking about there? He was talking about himself. Okay? While Jesus was there with them, they didn't need to fast. You know, in terms of the same way that the Pharisees and, and the disciples of John the Baptist were doing. Okay, now go next to Mark chapter 2. We're going to see the same thing recorded here. Slightly different detail, but Mark chapter 2. We're going to see where Jesus calls himself the bridegroom again. Mark chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. Okay, it says here, And the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast. And they come and say unto him, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees and of the Pharisees fast, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. Okay, so you see it again there. Now the third time this appears is in Luke chapter 5. So go over to Luke chapter 5, verse 33. We're going to see the same thing repeated here again. Luke chapter 5, verse 33. Okay, it says here, and, the, and they said unto him, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink? And he said unto them, Can ye make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. Okay? Now, is there any confusion at all about who Jesus Christ is here? Who he's calling himself? No. He is the 
bridegroom. There should be no confusion about that. Okay? So that's important to understand. And you'll see why as we continue in this study. All right? Now, John doesn't record this saying of Jesus, but he records something else which will be important later. Keep that in mind. Okay, now we covered the bridegroom. Now, who's the bride? Turn to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, we're going to look at uh, verses 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 and 2. Okay, it says here, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepare, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So, there you see New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, and she's adorned as a bride for her husband. Okay, now this is after the millennial kingdom has ended. This is where you're entering into eternity. All right. So this is not for a very long time out into the future, but the point is he sees the bride of the bridegroom there. He sees the bride of Jesus Christ, and she is a city. Very interesting because Satan also has a city that is his bride, essentially, and that is Mystery Babylon. You can read about that in Revelation chapter 17 and the destruction of Mystery Babylon in Revelation 18. But now look down at Revelation 21, verses 9 through 11. It says here, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Okay, you can read the rest of the chapter there sometime to see more detail into this city, but it's going to be remarkable. It's going to be absolutely beautiful, and that's where you're going to show up if you are a Christian right now in the church age. All right, that is your city. This is our final destination in terms of where we're going to go and then into eternity. All right, very, very exciting. Um, don't try to get riches down here on the earth uh, when you can have them there in heaven. Um, based on the, upon the things that you've done for the Lord down here. A lot of people give up earthly service to the Lord trying to obtain riches, which is really kind of stupid because the riches that you obtain down here are, are all corruptible and can be taken from you and will be taken from you eventually. But um, if you lay up treasures in heaven, they can't be taken from you and you're going to have them forever. So don't waste much time down here with your career and with all the other things of the world and entertainment and everything else, do things for the Lord. And I'm constantly poking and prodding people on that issue because I know how Christians are. And I know how I am. There are times that the cares and the deceitfulness of riches choke up with me too. You know, spring up, excuse me, and choke the word and I start to get a little bit unfruitful. There are times when I start to think about the things of the world. But brethren, you have to stay focused on eternity. That's our job as Christians, because this is where we're headed, New Jerusalem, all right? But continuing here, what about the espousal, all right? We've seen the bridegroom, we've seen the bride. We know who the bride is, we know who the bridegroom is, okay? What about the betrothal, the espousal? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Okay, it says here, For I am jealous over you with a godly, or with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Okay, now notice two very important things there. Number one, how many husbands are we espoused to? One. Um, well, maybe there's another way to heaven besides Jesus Christ. Maybe through Muhammad or maybe through the Pope or maybe through Joseph Smith or... Uh-uh. The bride of Christ is espoused to one husband. Jesus Christ is the way, 
the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. Okay, John 14, 6, and of course it's but by me there. But uh, the Bible also says that there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ is the only husband that you're going to have as a Christian. You're not going to have other husbands. Um, number two, how many virgins did you see in this passage? One. The reference to virgin is singular. Okay, We saw earlier there that the bride of Christ, it does not say brides of Christ. It's not plural. The Lord Jesus is not a polygamist. Okay, He marries one bride. So there is one man and one woman. All right. Now, spiritually speaking, I understand that there will be many, many millions and, you know, many hundreds of millions of, of saved Christians down through the centuries. I understand that. But symbolically, we are one bride, one virgin. And we're supposed to be a chaste virgin. You're supposed to keep yourself unspotted from the world. All right, that's very important. That's what, the pro that's what the process of sanctification is all about. But now go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 22 through 33. And now when we had our, our wedding ceremony, my wife and I, instead of having nice little marriage vows and um, I, Brian, take, you know, you to be my awfully wedded wife, you know, I'm kidding, it's lawfully, you know, but uh, instead of doing these little vows to, to have and to hold, to sickness and in health and all that, what we did is we went through Ephesians chapter 5 and we read these verses, verses 22 through 33, and that is the real instructions for you if you are a Christian and you are married. This is where you get your instructions for the proper roles in marriage. Okay? This is what you base your marriage on, in other words, not some vow that has really no basis in Scripture. I'm not saying the vow is bad, I'm just simply saying it's not in Scripture. Alright? This is. Ephesians 5.22 Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Let me just stop there for a second. You know, there's a very interesting thing out there that I've seen. All of these marriage help books and, and uh, how to have a happy marriage and everything else, if they leave out a wife being submissive to her husband and they try to teach equal authority, husband and wife, the marriage never works out. True marriage can only work when the wife understands her husband's position as the head of the home, spiritually speaking, and when she submits herself to that headship. That doesn't mean that she always agrees in everything. It just means she says, okay, my husband is the one who's appointed the head of this home. And when she puts herself into that position and says, I'm the wife, I'm going to submit myself to the rules of God. This isn't man-made tradition or something like that. When she puts herself in and says, I'm going to do what God says in his word, then God blesses the marriage. And then those dumb, stupid things that the husband does, all of a sudden, a lot of times they'll be corrected. Why? Because the wife is doing her part. Okay? And the husband, if you're some kind of a sissy and you're letting your wife push you around all the time, and you're letting her make all the decisions, God's not going to bless your marriage either. And that doesn't mean you have to treat her like dirt and knock her around and stuff and, and yell at her. No, it just means you have to be a man. You know, act like a man. Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Do you have to be a man to give yourself, to be willing to, to die for your wife? Does that take some courage? Yeah. And you have to be willing to do that if you're a man. If you hear a bump in the night, you don't tell your honey to your wife or whatever, you know, uh, you bolt the door, I'll get under the covers or something like that. I'll hide my head under the covers. No. Get up and go down and protect the house. That's your job, man. You know? <laughs> you have to be willing to give yourself for your wife. 
Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. See, your authority needs to be based on love. See, very important there. But notice too, it says there in verse 26, that you are actually to sanctify and cleanse. It's talking about the church there, but it's, in, it's pointing at you too, as a husband, that you're to sanctify and cleanse your wife with the washing of water by the word. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 talks about that the woman is supposed to be silent, and if she's to learn anything, she's to ask her husband at home. What does that mean? That means that every husband out there has a responsibility to know the book so he can teach his wife and his children. And if you're saved, you got to be a man. You know, step up to the plate, so to speak. You know, you got to, that's very, very important. Don't rely on some pastor in a building someplace to answer your questions for you because you're paying his salary. All right, it's fine to ask questions of a pastor out there, a man that teaches the Bible. That's fine. But you need to be the ruler in your home, not your pastor. But continuing here, verse 29, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this call shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Okay, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Don't get into these, these jokes and you know about, oh, men are just big dumb animals and, and men are just this and that. And you know, let me just say something else. If you make a regular diet of watching television, you will see that that thing is overrun with feminist philosophy. The men on there are pot-bellied, beer-drinking couch potatoes that sit around and grunt and yell at sports. Uh, that's not men. A man is a man that can come out and work with his hands, that knows about nature, that can read the Bible and preach the Bible and can witness to people. That's a man. Okay, A man that has skills with his hands, that can do things, that is a good, strong leader, that knows how to rule his, his own house well. Uh, a man that can, that can lovingly instruct his wife and his children. And you say, well, brother, I'm having a hard time with that. You know, I'm a Christian man, but I'm really having a hard time. Okay, then pray about it. And get in the book and study the book. Okay, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The more of this you put into your heart, the more of this you put into your mind, the easier it's going to be for you to rule your home. Okay, important to get that. What about the guests? Okay, we've seen the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, the bride, his church, the body of Christ, Christians, real, true, saved Christians. We've seen about the betrothal. We are betrothed right now. We have not been um, going through the wedding ceremony yet. We're going to be touching on that here in a minute. But what about the guests? John chapter 3. Now we get to the book of John. It talked about the bridegroom there in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but John didn't have anything in it about the bridegroom. But now we're going to see here, John chapter 3, verses 25 through 30. Okay. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John, he's talking about John the Baptist here, and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men, all men come to him. John answered and said, A man cannot, or can receive nothing, except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness, that I said, I am not the Christ, but the, that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, or you see it there, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Okay? Now notice a couple points there. Okay? What did John say there? He said, verse 29, the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth 
and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. What was John the Baptist? Doctrinally speaking, John the Baptist was an Old Testament saint. John died before the New Testament came in. And again, you know, but it's in the New Testament. It's in the book of, you know, the, the New Testament books. It's in the Gospels. Uh, it's in the books that are called, you know, as part of the New Testament. But the New Testament doesn't begin with, until the death of the testator. Jesus Christ brings in the death, or brings in the New Testament, okay? Hebrews chapter 9, you can read about that. John the Baptist is beheaded before that happens. So he died, he's an Old Testament saint. And what's he say? He doesn't say, I'm part of the bride. He says, I'm a friend of the bridegroom. Okay? He's kind of like the honored guest there, you know, that, that comes in the, you know, the best man, maybe, if you will. But he's the friend of the bridegroom. The Old Testament saints are that. And look what he says there in verse 30. He must increase, talking about Jesus Christ, but I must decrease. Think about that dispensationally. What do we have there? You have the body of Christ, Christianity, increasing. Jesus dies on the cross, and now whosoever will, let him come, you know, come and, and get saved. So Jesus Christ increases, the Old Testament saints decrease. John the Baptist was probably one of the last Old Testament saints to get in. He decreases while the body of Christ increases. You see it there? Pretty interesting. Now, notice in, or now we'll turn next to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. Uh, verse 1 through 10. Here we're going to see about another thing about these Old Testament Jews, which were around at the time of Jesus Christ while he was there on the earth. Matthew chapter 22, verse 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven... Now, if you remember other studies, Matthew chapter 11 talks about the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. Every time you read the kingdom of heaven in your King James Bible, it's talking about the physical earthly kingdom that will be there in the millennial kingdom. Okay, It was offered to the Jews back there in the first century because Jesus is their king. They rejected Jesus as their Messiah, as their king. And so that millennial kingdom was put off for approximately 2,000 years. Okay, But every time you see kingdom of heaven, that's what it's a reference to. It's never once a reference to heaven where God dwells. So... Verse 2, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, and another to his merchandise. Hmm. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Let me just stop there for a minute. What you have there is the Old Testament, the completion of the Old Testament. What, what happens at the end of the Old Testament is the Jews, the king, God the Father, sends his son and says, Hey, how about it, you know? I'm sending you my, my, the Messiah here. He's here. You want him? No. Get him out of here. We don't want him. You, we have no king but Caesar. That was a real stupid thing for them to say when Jesus was going to, you know, when he was on trial and going to be crucified. You know, they wanted Caesar as their king. And, you know, the Jews have suffered more at the hands of the Roman Catholics than anybody else. You know, and you say, what about Islam? Well, Islam is a branch of Roman Catholicism. So, you know, uh, two sides of the same corrupt coin. But uh, you see the thing there. What happens when Jesus Christ is there in Matthew chapter 24 and they come out and they show him the buildings and everything? What does Jesus say? He says, I tell you, not one stone shall be left upon another. You know, it's all going to be thrown down. It's all going to be torn down. Uh, when did that happen? So, uh, about 70 AD. 
Titus came in, you know, the Roman uh, emperor came in and destroyed Jerusalem. So what's going on there? Well, verse 7, But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Um, who did the Jews murder? They murdered an innocent man, didn't they? Who was it? Jesus Christ. So it's very interesting there and very telling. Um, God actually calls the Roman, pagan Roman soldiers, he says, my army. You see, God controls all the armies of the world. In spite of what some of the conspiracy people try to tell you, that Satan and his Illuminati send out these armies and God's up there kind of going, oh no, what am I going to do? No. God controls all the armies of the world. And when a people get so far out and so far away from the Lord and they, don't, and they reject Jesus Christ, the Lord says, oh, let's see, I'm going to go down there and pick one of my armies how about the communist Chinese or the communist Russians or the Islamic armies? Go on in there and wipe those people out. See, if an army wants to invade a country and God says no, the answer is no. <laughs> There's not going to be any army that's going to get by God. All right. God has everything under control. Don't you worry about it. But you see there, Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 7, that's the Old Testament. Now look at verse 8. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Those Old Testament Jews. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Okay? So they go out. You say, oh, then this is the church age. No, it's not the church age. All right? What I believe happens here, the church age is actually between verses 7 and 8. All right? This, these servants that go out to gather the people to become guests at the wedding, remember, the bride of Christ is the one who's marrying Jesus Christ. We are the bride. He is the bridegroom. So we can't be guests at our own wedding. See? See? These guests are the tribulation saints. Okay? The time of Jacob's trouble saints. I'll say it that way. They are the ones that show up as the other guests, the other set of guests at, you know, the wedding. And we're going to come back to verses 11 through th uh, 14. We'll be back there in, in just a little bit. All right? Because there's something very significant in verses 11 through 14, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. Next, go to Matthew chapter 25. Now, this is a very often misquoted portion of Scripture. People try to liken this to the rapture, to the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, you know, and everything. It does not have anything to do with the bride of Christ. Okay, I'm going to show you about that. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were, were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Remember all this stuff, it's going to be important later. Verse 11, Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Okay? I want you to notice two very important things there. Number one, do they go out to marry the bridegroom? No. They go out to meet the bridegroom. Okay? Number two... Uh, you have their, uh, trying to think of what I was going to say, the second thing there. Oh, I know what I was going to say, sorry. Uh, 
didn't get much sleep last night, so I'm kind of a little off. <laughs> um, number two, didn't it say there in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ? Why are there five, five virgins here? And five of them miss this event that's happening. Well, that would mean that uh, part of the virgins there lost their salvation. How does that work for a Christian in the church age? We're sealed under the day of redemption. See, it doesn't work. This is nothing to do with the body of Christ right now. Okay, These are saints in that time of Jacob's trouble. And we're going to get more into that as we continue through the study. But what about this thing about them buying oil? You know, They didn't have enough oil for their lamp. Their lamp goes out and they say, go and buy you know, this oil. A lot of people try to say, well, the oil, you see, is the Holy Spirit. Let me show you why that doesn't work. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verse 17. Okay, it says here, Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Okay? Let's see what the reaction is here. Verse 19, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. You know, it doesn't sound to me like you can buy the Holy Spirit. Because you can't. You can't buy the Holy Spirit. Okay? The Holy Spirit comes upon you when you get saved. And it's kind of interesting because the ones that the Holy Spirit actually will work in are those that are humble. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. You know? If you got lots of money and if you're a big, big shot in society and everything like that, the Bible says not many mighty, not many noble you know, are called there in 1 Corinthians. Um, God doesn't choose the powerful and the rich and the influential. He chooses the weak. Okay, That's who he chooses. So, But you're never going to see this thing. You, know, you get some guy who's a multi-millionaire. He's going to have to get down onto the street level and hang out with the, you know, stupid hillbillies like me. You know, if he wants to amount to anything for the Lord. Okay. Why does God use me? Well, partly is because I really don't have any credibility with any kind of other things in life. <laughs> you know, I'm not highly educated. I don't have five earned degrees or anything like that. I'm certainly not wealthy. You know, you say, well, you know, how much did you have to spend to get the Holy Spirit? Uh, my life. I had to give my life, you know, lose my life to save it. But these people try to save their life, they're the ones that lose it. See, if you want Holy Spirit power, you need to bring yourself down a few notches. Don't think that you are some kind of great special thing out there that everybody just should be privileged to be in your presence. Um, no no, you're never going to get the Holy Spirit that way. And you can't buy the Holy Spirit with money. So don't make money the goal of your life. Okay, read 1 Timothy chapter 6 about that. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in perdition. You know, uh, don't try to, to be rich. You can't buy the Holy Spirit. And you certainly don't see... These, these five foolish virgins that are buying oil, uh, they're not buying the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now next, we saw, you know, all the different things there, and we've seen the betrothal there. Now what comes next? And, of course, the inviting of the guests, well, then you have the wedding ceremony, the actual day when it happens. Now when does that take place? Revelation chapter 19 
Revelation chapter 19, verse 1. Okay, Revelation 19, 1 says, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Uh, that's the Catholic Church right there, by the way. And we're going to be celebrating when the Catholic Church is destroyed. Okay, verse 3. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So you see there the wedding ceremony. Now a lot of people will teach you that the wedding ceremony happens immediately followed by the marriage supper. And then we come back down to the earth. But here's my contention. I don't believe that. I always did believe that until um, I think it was uh, Pastor um, Dan, I think, out at uh, Gateway Anabaptist Church. I heard a sermon from him, and he talked about that he believes that the marriage supper is on the earth. And he talked about a few points, and I thought, hmm. And I've looked into it, and I've read it, and read all the passages over and over again, and... and uh, I think it happens on the earth. And I'm going to show you the reason why uh, as we continue here. But, you know, what happens here, you know, is in verses 11 down through 21, we come back with Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ destroys the Antichrist and the false prophet, casts them down in the lake of fire, and then he kills their army, this 200 million man army that the Antichrist has amassed. You know, the United Nations military there towards the end of the thing, they're going out to wipe out the Jews, the small remnant of the Jews that are left, and we come back down and save those Jews, that small remnant, and wipe them out. And then the saints go out and gather together the nations to bring them to Jerusalem to be judged by Jesus Christ. And he separates them. The sheep go to the right hand. The goats go to the left. Okay? So that's what's going on there. And so there's some work to be done, you know, before the marriage supper. I'm going to show you why I say that. Turn to Luke chapter 12. 